Hello, it's Chuck from Above the Basement, Boston Music and Conversation. Before we begin this episode, we would like to take a moment to encourage all our listeners to vote on Tuesday, November 6th. Voters have the opportunity to elect candidates of their choice and decide on statewide ballot questions that can change state law. In Massachusetts, polling places are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. statewide on Election Day. Early voting has already started and ends November 2nd. If you are unable to go to the polls or vote early, absentee ballots are easily available before the election. Many have said this is the most important election this country has seen in many years, so make your voice count. You can find out where and when to vote in any election information you need for your state at usa.gov forward slash election dash office. So speaking of voting... Ronnie and I went to City Hall in Boston to talk with the new Chief of Arts and Culture, Cara Elliott Ortega. The Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture's mission is to support artists, the cultural sector, and to promote access to the arts for all. Cara recently worked as the Director of Planning and Policy in the Arts Cabinet for three years, implementing Boston's cultural plan called Boston Creates. We were also happy to have Communications Director Christina Carroll join us. We sat in a conference room overlooking Faneuil Hall and discussed how the Boston Red Sox Duck Boat Victory Parade will crawl through these historic streets once again this week. Other than our recent world championship, we talked about the current state of the arts in Boston and the work Kara's team is doing to promote equity, diversity, and inclusion in the Boston arts scene. We also had our photographer Joe Wallace pipe in a few questions. So here is our conversation with Kara Elliott Ortega and Christina Carroll, recorded at City Hall in Boston, Massachusetts. It doesn't go past here, does it? Does it go here? It starts at Fenway and it comes up Tremont, right? Mm-hmm. And, then, and then Cambridge Street. So yeah, like, I think it ends in a rally. No, there's no rally this there's year. No rally. There's no rally this year. No. Well, that's better for us. Why no rally? I don't know. But Mayor Wall said there's no rally. Yeah. You're, both, you're, you're originally a Boston. Well, you're from Providence. Providence. But you've been in Boston for quite a while now. A few years. A few years. And how about you, Christina? I was born in Boston. Born in Boston. Yep. Okay, so you both, under, mm-hmm. although you're a little younger, you both understand what it was like before 2004. Yeah. Right, before when we hadn't won. So I was in New York during that whole time that we hadn't won. I'm a Red Sox fan living in New York, being tortured <laughs> by all those Yankee fans down there. <laughs> I, would, I would work in the city, and I'd have my Red Sox hat on and walk in, and they'd had the parade all the time. They were, you know, the, during the 90s, they went five like years in a row, year, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was such torture. And now, my daughter, I woke her up last night, like, they're about to win the World Series. She could have cared less. Yeah, she's unfazed. You unfazed. can call Christina if you need to. It's every, every two years, we win a championship. We've won, what, how many, cha- like 11 championships with Red Sox, Bruins, Celtics, and Patriots. Patriots, yeah. That's five, nine, 10, 11. It's 11 championships. We don't know what it's like not to win a championship anymore. Whereas mm-hmm. before... We had, we had been 1986. Yeah, I'm just so gonna do one of the here. disagreements in the office was whether or not losing builds character. It does. And now we're kind of spoiled. So, yeah. oh, so you agree? I don't right? think so. Yeah, no, you're you're just happy. Yeah. You don't think losing builds character? <laughs> I think we've lost enough in the past. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but if we never we've win, built a, enough character. But if we never win again, <laughs> or at least in my lifetime, we're still better off than most of the cities yeah. in the United States. Yeah, that's true. But you could have a whole lifetime of losing ahead of you. I know. My daughter's gonna. She's not gonna. She's gonna not even pay attention to it. Like, she doesn't even. She doesn't realize what she's in. The golden age of, yeah. of New England sports. I gotta turn this off. Oh, Ron's on his way. Cool. He's but, he's. but he's not feeling very well. So thank you both for for doing this. First of all, I, I just only met you and I obviously through email. Mm-hmm. So you're Christina. I'm sorry. What's your last name again? Carol. Christina Carol. Mm-hmm. And what do you do? I'm the communications director. The for communications the, director? Uh, yeah, the arts and culture office. Arts and culture office. Okay. And Kara, you are, what's the title? You are the, I Chief. got it, Chief <laughs> of Arts and Culture. Yes. Chief. Chief. It's pretty high in fluten. It is. It's a good title, right? It's not bad, Chief. Yeah. <laughs> I've never met a Chief before. Like, I've met, like, directors and CEOs and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But Chief it sounds very, I like it. She makes us all call her chief daily. (laughs) (laughs) And now the lies begin. I'm regretting it already. (laughs) But uh, so you just named uh, just what, like three, four months ago? About a month and a half ago. Month and not even that long. But you were the interim. I was the interim since July. Uh, Okay. So how long have you been with the city? 
Almost exactly a year, a little over a year. I started last September. You started last September mm-hmm. in the same role? Yes. As communications director? Yes. Coming from where? Um, I worked at a startup in Needham called College Week Live, and I did marketing for them. That was my first like post-college job. I oh. went to Emerson for you journalism. Went- oh, really? Mm-hmm. My daughter was looking at Emerson. Really? Yeah. She fan. liked it. I think she's applying there, but she's, um, she's trying to get an early decision at Ithaca. But I, I went to Northeastern. Emerson, Emerson people, yes, hence the hat. Uh, and there are a ton of, I hung out with a ton of Emerson people, too, mm-hmm. and they were all good people. I'm considering going back to school for a master's in history. Really? At Northeastern. I, so I, while I was there talking to people, I stopped in the store and bought a hat. That's my story. <laughs> um, you came uh, from the startup, and you started as communications director. Mm-hmm. And for you, before you were interim... Yep. I mean, I know your history, but maybe you can kind of tell... Yeah, I've been in the office for three years, So I came in as director of planning and policy out of grad school in city planning. So I got my my master's in city planning. You were at MIT? At MIT. And I had a little time where I was working for MIT, and then I started here. Can I ask a question since Ron's on here? Yeah. What does that actually mean? Well, so I went to MIT for city planning, which I think is known for having a pretty wide-ranging program. So there were all sorts of people in that, like people who had started nonprofits bringing infrastructure to Africa, like into rural towns and just all sorts of things, community organizers. So I have kind of an organizing background. Here we were planning the city's first cultural plan, Boston Creates. The 10-year cultural plan. But that's kind of an unusual thing for a city planner to do. So I'm kind of in this realm of like cultural planning. I mean, it's not like a built out field, I think, at this point. It's not like you can go to every city and find a, a quote unquote cultural planner. Yeah, I mean, like, what does that even mean, right? So yeah. you're basically kind of winging it as you go along. Yeah, right? making it all up. I don't mean that, <laughs> I'm, I don't mean that tongue in cheek or anything. I mean, it's this is what we need to do to increase awareness, to increase the ability for artists to live here. And yep. that, that's basically the, the premise, correct? Yeah, that's the premise. I mean, I think it's, it's also a little bit different because it's not a spatial plan. So. A lot of city planners traditionally are working on like neighborhood plans where you're looking at land use and zoning and this is kind of a sector plan it's like looking at the whole arts ecosystem and thinking about what does it mean for the city to support this and what do we want that system to look like it's also really ambitious because we put into it things that are kind of like bigger picture goals for the sector that the city isn't necessarily responsible for so even in the world of cultural plans most cities say okay, this is what our arts office is going to do. Like, here are the three things. And we didn't do that. We said, here's what should happen regardless of who's doing it. Here's what we think we can do, but here's what we think other people need to do. I mean, it's an exciting time to think about it because if you go back to the plan, which came out two years ago, I think there's still a lot of work that we need to do. And so it's now this time of going back and saying, okay, if we really wanted to take on these things, like what would they cost? And how are we going to justify that? And do we have the capacity to do that? Or should it actually be somebody else doing it? So when the plan came out, one of the things that we heard a lot about was that individual artists needed more support and recognition and more funding and just resources generally. So we did a lot to try to address that. Micro grants for artists, professional development opportunities. We have an artist fellowship and just like a lot of kind of entry-level sort of opportunities for artists. Out of that, we've gotten pretty good at doing the professional development piece and really thinking about what does it mean for artists to be sole proprietors and kind of their own businesses and how do we support them in that, especially when not everyone who's making art thinks of themselves as an artist. And then also not everyone who thinks of themselves as an artist understands that they're really a business and what that means, maybe until they have to do their taxes and it's like, oh my gosh, what do I do? So that's like one example of the kind of thing where it's like, well, we know this is an issue. We've started to do some work there. And what does it mean to actually turn that into a program now? We spoke recently with a woman named Ash Gordon. Mm -hmm. You know her? She's with a cross-cultural collective. And they were applying for, I think it was on uh, on the seaport there, there was a space that they were hoping to get. I don't know where that... Yeah, that hasn't been announced yet. Hasn't been announced yet. But this would be one of those initiatives that you speak of, right? Yeah, well, I think space is its own really big question. That's a really exceptional opportunity in the seaport where we get to find space that's basically rent-free. Especially in that area. Yeah, especially in that area. So that's a huge opportunity. But yeah, I think space is a a problem whether you're an artist or a nonprofit or commercial or not. It's a problem all around. So I feel right now that Boston as an economy, as a city of higher learning, as a city of, of medicine, it almost seems like there's a renaissance going on. 
and you can just see it just in, the, just in the, all the building that's going on. You can see it building up the, the seaport there. I see it um, with all the different artists coming into Boston. And obviously, now that the Red Sox has won the World Series, <laughs> we're becoming, I mean, we win so much that people know who we are now. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's not just a little city. I mean, Boston, yeah. we, I, t- I took a, a class at, at Northeastern 2,000 years ago, and um, it was a history of Boston. And my professor was like, Boston is the greatest city on the face of the earth. I hope you all know that. And we all agreed. Well, at least I did. But, you know, we had an inferiority complex when we were losing all the time. Yeah. But now that we're winning all the time. <laughs> Anyways, I digress. But it being such a great city with all these other things, right, there tends to be a problem for artists to get a foothold into certain places, a problem for venues to be able to afford yeah. rents, to be able to pay artists to come in. We had um, a string of, of venues that shut down yeah. um, because they just couldn't afford the rents. A lot of the artists that we talked to, a lot of the musicians, they keep on moving further out just because rents are so high. I mean, there's a lot there, but there certainly is the initial problem of being able to have people afford to live in the city when you want to have all this culture in the city. Yeah, and our, you know, our having like micro grants for artists is not going to solve the problem of you know, housing affordability. I think this is one of the things where when we're talking about the intersection of all these different kind of systemic issues that are happening in the city, this is why it's so important for us as an arts office to be really connected to like the housing office and to the planning agency and to be super integrated and also introduce those agencies and those initiatives to the problems that artists are facing, some of which are the same, you know, like affordability generally, and some of which then have nuances on top of that that other people might not understand. Like, right needing to have access to industrial space so that you can be really loud or make a mess or do the things that you need to do in order to actually like make the work and do the labor of making art, which I think is something that people kind of just generally don't understand unless they, you know, they're an artist themselves or they know someone who's doing it. So that's been, I think, the benefit of being in the position that I was in before as a planner. A lot of the work that I was doing wasn't just on the cultural plan, but also on connecting our work with the work from other departments and other kind of planning efforts and kind of strategy going on in other parts of the city. We actually worked with the Department of Neighborhood Development, which works on affordable housing, and found a piece of city-owned land in East Boston. And we worked with them to RFP that out for development, specifically for affordable artists. I'm sorry, RFP work. is, what is RFP? Request for proposal, sorry, bureaucracy okay. language. <laughs> So basically putting it out for development, but we get to set what the parameters of that are because it's city-owned land. So yeah, so it's going to be affordable artists live workspace, and we're trying to figure out kind of what does that mean and all in one building to have maybe it's like affordable on the upper floors and a shared workspace on the first floor or something like that. And that's a process that we help run through our office, but it's the first time that we've done kind of a whole building that way through public owned lands. That's a really exciting pilot project that we're doing right now. But we can only do that by having these really good relationships in these other areas. So it's one building, but it's a kind of an interesting start. You have a question? Go ahead, John. (laughs) So I, I have to admit that I did not read the plan that you said is already in place for the last two years. So I thought it would be interesting for the listeners to know what are the top five priorities, let's say, or three that are in that plan and sort of how it's going about executing those plans. And I'm also really curious on how Boston's priorities are different than another major city of similar size and sort of what are your challenges versus other cities that people might identify with? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think Boston's growth and population size, kind of like the things that the characteristics of... It's Ron. Hello. Shouldn't you be wearing like a hazmat suit? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very sorry to interrupt, but I have Calstat. I'm fine. Is that what you're asking? I'm asking if you're okay. Yes. Right, I'm moving away from you. This is. I'm very sorry to interrupt. This is a great, great. Ryan, this is struggle. this is this is Kara. Hi, how are you? And this is Christina. Hi, Christina. Christina is a communications director. Yeah. So we only have three microphones. So you're gonna have to share with me. Just try not to put the microphone too close to your mouth. You gonna be okay? Fine. He's had a long day. <laughs> the poor guy. All right, well, so continue your answer. Do you remember what the question was? Yes. Well, I was just thinking about the relationship between our plan and how that's to Boston and what's different about other cities. And I do think we're one of 
a few cities that's experiencing this much growth so quickly um, where the prices are this high. So if you look at like the comps for, you know, what rent would be, you know, Seattle is booming and I think is experiencing some similar issues. San Francisco, like these other super expensive cities. And we're not as bad as San Francisco, but, you know, if you just look at what the what the big issues are, we're it's really a couple of cities and, and us. So that makes it a pretty small cohort of people who you can look to for other examples and see like what's working or not working. In terms of what's in the plan, there were a few things that really rose to the top. I mean, I mentioned the individual artists and the need to recognize individual artists. And the only grant available to individuals was at the state level, and it was like an artistic excellence fellowship. And now there's our grants, of which we have two or three, kind of one that's ongoing and is like a kind of a low barrier to get. And then there's also New England Foundation for the Arts has a public art grant that they didn't used to have. And the Boston Foundation has Live Arts Boston and a couple other things that can go to individuals or artist collectives. Like you don't have to be a nonprofit and that's still kind of new. Some things have really changed since we put the plan out, which is helpful to think about. Like that landscape is a little bit different. But another thing we heard about was equity. We did all these town halls. We did this engagement process with artists called What Artists Need, K-N-E-A-D, where artists like made bread and talked. Um, I like it. (laughs) And equity came up a lot and in a lot of different ways. People feeling like you had to know somebody in order to get access to opportunities. Like it wasn't really, a lot of these opportunities weren't truly open. People feeling like white artists or white art forms were privileged over other kinds of expression. And people from the other side saying like, where's the space for hip hop in the city of Boston? Why isn't there any venue that's owned by people of color that's dedicated to those art forms? So a lot of those issues came up, issues of culturally specific representation. So like, why aren't we doing more to celebrate and promote the Haitian community or these other kinds of immigrant communities and cultures that are in the city. And I think people feeling like there is this narrative, sports, clam chowder, American Revolution narrative of Boston that gets elevated a lot and gets supported a lot when really Boston's a super diverse place with a lot of other things going on. So a lot of whiteness. Yeah, a lot of whiteness. And I think people feeling like a lot of whiteness for a long time. And that also goes even into how like the big institutions have been funded because it's a lot of these kind of older, wealthy, white legacy families who tend to give money in a more traditional way, which is why you get more funding maybe going to like classical music versus some other kind of emerging or more risk-taking form. When you watch the Red Sox... I don't know if Chuck brought up the socks yet because I, I would be. <laughs> I knew he was going to, and that's why I'm late. Well, they because won like 20 minutes ago. We can still celebrate the Red Sox exactly. and understand I knew it would be 10 minutes, a, and then I'd come in. That's, that's culture. The reason why I bring up the socks, though, if you look at the roster, 80, 90% are not white now. Mm. You were talking about sports and Sam Adams, Tea Party, right. white history. How do you channel the current change in Boston to things like the Celtics for a lot of African-American players, the Red Sox, that are just leading with Latina and black? We were the first so, Puerto Rican manager in MLB history. So how do we make sense of that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, I heard someone put this dynamic poignantly. They said, who are the entertainers versus the people in power? And I think that there is a question, you know, where's the ownership? Who gets to make the decisions about, you know, what tone the Red Sox take or any sports team takes about what the culture is or what the money goes toward or what the space goes toward, right? I mean, so one of the other big things that came out of the plan was funding for public art, which the city has never really been in the driver's seat of commissioning new public art because there hasn't been the money for it. The mayor started a new fund that's a percent for art program where 1% of all of the money that we spend on capital construction projects for the year goes into a special fund for putting artwork into those construction projects. New schools, new parks, etc. could all have these new pieces of art in them. With the percent for art program, it's like with that money and being in the driver's seat comes this burden of what are you putting out into the public sphere permanently in terms of representation? What are you representing? What stories are you representing? Who's actually getting paid through that work? So who are the artists? Where are they coming from? Who do they represent? We have kind of a complicated history and landscape for that. And it's been like the topic of memorials and monuments has been really, really big right now with the MLK project. 
that's slated to go into the common. On the one hand, it does mean something, like the representation of those things in space is obviously important and that means something to people. And then of course, it's not like a panacea, like it's not gonna change race dynamics in the city. So it's kind of thinking about how do we actually assess that and have a strategy around it, I think is really complicated. So many of the artists that we've talked to We've talked to Dutch Rebel. She's Haitian. She's I knows, love Dutch. You love Dutch? Yeah. So you know Dutch. Uh, Mo Pope. I'm sure you know Mo, yeah. Mo as well. Um, how hard it is for them to get a venue to allow hip hop to, yep. to play. And not only that, but it's also having a venues that allow kids under 21 to oh, yeah, all ages. All, yeah. all ages. That's a huge, huge problem in a city that is full of underage students. On the train today, I posted something to all of the the greater above the basement fans out there. Christine, so, she listened to the, uh, the um, Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages. Oh, good. That's hot off the press. Yeah, Katie, it was. Katie, Katie Lamarco. How'd you th- How'd you like it. the singing? It was. I liked it. I skipped through. I was skipping through because I saw the plug, like the teaser about you guys singing. So I was like, "Where is it?" And yeah. I was <laughs> skipping through, and then I found it. Oh, that's that's good. That's good feedback. Market <laughs> research. Yeah. yeah. Actually, he did most of the yeah. It's good yeah. clickbait. I posted this morning. Hey, Boston, what's your sock song? Love that dirty water was the first that came up. Then we had the version of shipping up to Boston, Andrus Nelson's, who challenged the L.A. Yeah. Symphony. Okay. Christina's all and, over the L.A. Yeah. culture warfare right oh excellent. yeah we're in the, yeah. We were then, in the middle of an instagram twitter war oh nice yeah. we love it <laughs> yeah. and of course someone said sweet caroline does anything come to mind for your sock song the chief and the communications director. Sounds like director a communications director question to me. <laughs> for arts and culture tessie's a good one that's not included in there but it's like a little lesser known that's very 2004 yeah <laughs> but it's i feel like it's carried I don't over i don't know Tessie. you don't it's Dropkick Murphys. It's in the soundtrack to that movie with, uh, what's his name? Yeah. Um, Drew Barrymore. Oh, Fever Pitch. Fever yes. Pitch. They played it at Jimmy the Fallon. end. What's that? Fallon. Jimmy mm-hmm. Fallon. Yeah, yeah. But I would say, like, my favorite is Dirty Water because they always play that when they win. So that's, like, the, the biggest By who? song. I don't know. The Standells. Yeah, Dirty Water's a great song. These guys brought up some of the issues that have come up when we've been meeting and interviewing artists all over the city, mostly musicians, but not always. And one of the things that's perceived in Boston by some musicians is that when you get it together, you have to leave to New York or L.A. And I'm curious, is there this perception that if they hit the big time, they have to go? And how? what are you doing about that perception in terms of keeping arts vibrant? I think it's a perception in particular among musicians. I'm not sure that it translates to other disciplines quite so much. Although there are, I think each market has has challenges. If you are a visual artist and you need to rely on galleries and a big gallery system in order to make it, you know, you're going to have limitations. I think a lot of this ties back to the affordability question. But I also think that we have a lot of artists here who are later in their careers who have been successful and they might still be based in Boston, even though they travel around the world. I feel like we also have some kind of mid-career folks, including maybe some musicians who are making a living. And I think that's the other thing. It's like, well, do you need to quote unquote, like make it and keep finding like a bigger and bigger market or get signed to whatever? Or are you trying to like make a living as a musician? Like, I think you can definitely make a living as a musician in Boston. I think people are doing that. But I think a lot of it just ties back to affordability. Like if students could still have access to space and materials upon graduating, I think we'd be retaining a lot more people. But the fact that you graduate from school and you don't have access to a recording studio or a studio to do visual art and you're just like out in the market trying to pay rent and get a job, I mean, that's going to be hard. A lot of the artists that we've talked to have come back to Boston. They maybe were in New York Mm -hmm. and now they've come back to their roots. One thing that we've really noticed is that the the community and the camaraderie. A lot of people, we just talked to this woman, um, Talia Zedek. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know Talia? She's fantastic. And, you know, she's still here. She's still yeah. rocking, rocking out. Yeah. That's what I really love about it. And that's what Boston can afford because it's such a small city, too. It's so impressive. Like, we talk with a lot of people that are in the Boston music and art scene. And a lot of people won't know those names. There's just so many names. Mm-hmm you seem to have a good sense and that's just one arm that's just music how do you get in there are you physically there do you have feelers out there do you read mostly and listen yeah do you want to take a stab at that um so one thing that we've done recently is we created an instagram account which is our pride and joy it is it's very exciting and you would think when you think of it you just think of it as being like a social media channel that young people use but it's actually 
we found that there are tons of artists. That's their primary form of yeah. getting the word out and connecting with other artists too. So it's been really great. We have an artist resource manager in our office and her and I have just kind of been taking turns just going through and just scrolling through different artists' profiles. And we, I add at least 30 artists a day probably. Yeah, same. And they post flyers about Boston. at Arts in Boston. Because um, one theme we've talked about over the last couple of years has been the need for social media not want, but the need mm -hmm. for these artists, but also the connection to live and the human mm -hmm. experience. So one thing that always comes up is that balance. You're getting people in a room that are on Instagram, frankly, on their couch, listening to great music. Mm -hmm. And that's great. You're spreading it around. These, these used to be the flyers that would be up on the walls. Oh, yeah. Right? You'd be walking down the street and you'd see some billboards and things would be plastered What's with all these bands you never heard of. And you'd be like, oh, they're playing tomorrow night. Now mm -hmm. that's what Instagram has turned into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah, that's I true. Think I am a music person. Mm -hmm. So I was going to say I'm from Providence and I grew up going to AS220 in Providence. So all ages, local music is like my happy place. And that's also where you would find like all the flyers and all the things about what's going on. And people like it would be the place where you just go in person and you didn't have to like know what was happening. You would just show up and trust that whatever it was would be at least weird, if not good. We don't have enough spaces like that. But I think it's been interesting with Instagram to find so many young artists, emerging artists. Um, and a lot of people are promoting themselves that way. I was just on a panel mm -hmm. with two young women, visual artists, who specifically want to highlight visual art by young people of color in Boston. And it's called Hood Grown Aesthetics. Uh. And they have their own podcast. And that's the other thing. Like the podcasts coming out of Podcast Garage in Alston right. are amazing. And that's another kind of one of those spaces that's cultivating that. Right. But I could also like after an event, get an event every day after work last week and I'm in the car on the way home and I can use Instagram to like tune in to um, Black Cotton Club was having a thing live in Dudley. And I can like watch that in the cab on the way home and be like, oh, I don't know some of these people. I wonder who they are. Oh, they're tagged in this video. I can follow them on Instagram. So that has actually been super influential for me. But one thing that I, I would like for Boston to have at some point in the future that's like just a muscle that I think needs to get stronger is like big collective arts experiences. We don't have too many things like that right now. And, and music shows is like one form of that, whether it's festivals or like more kind of experiential, but on a larger scale. It's more like festival arts festivals in other cities. Like Montreal has some really interesting festivals. Even Providence like shuts down all of downtown for like big kind of arts music things. And I feel like it'd be it would be nice for us to have more like that. They've been doing that two or three times a year, shutting down Newbury Street, which has been yeah. great. And I think they need to include more art in that and mm -hmm. not just, I mean, it's great for the storefronts and to put you know tables out and people can eat and, and things like that. But incorporating art into that would be fantastic. Yeah. I think what they've done with the Rose Kennedy Parkway oh, there, definitely. they put up those uh, neon signs there. Yeah. That's fantastic. A lot of people don't even know it, it exists. That's that's another problem, though. It's like a lot of people don't know that these things are happening. Happening. We emceed the Berkeley <laughs> drum off. What's that? Go to Instagram and find it. That's true. But we emceed the Berkeley drum off that was on Mass Ave, was it? Oh, I don't know about that. It's, it's with Blue Man Group in um. Berkeley, and they have musicians play. It's like a jazz festival. These events, I mean, Newbury Street notwithstanding, they open up neighborhoods to people who would never, on other occasions, go there for yeah, any other how, reason. How do you open up other neighborhoods? Well, did you guys go to Bams Fest? No, but I did go to Honk. Okay, well, I recommend Bams Fest, which is nothing what like is Honk. What is Bams Fest? <laughs> <laughs> it is a new festival that just started last year, and you should actually you should interview Catherine Morris, who heads it up. And it's all kind of focused on not just hip hop, but like mm. soul and other kinds of music that don't normally get a lot of airtime. Where is it? It was in Franklin Park. But it's yeah. interesting because she's trying to like single-handedly do this thing. Yeah. And it also has all of this like symbolic meaning about like highlighting these genres, highlighting local artists of color, being in Franklin Park, a place that um, hasn't had like a ton of programming recently and making that a place where people can come together. I mean, it is kind of like this magical central park that touches all these neighborhoods. Yeah, uh, We've run into a lot of nonprofit music based programs, whether it be Girls Rock mm -hmm. or Zoomix or the Record Co. There's a ton of these institutions that have been started up by one or two people and they're a nonprofit and they've been raising money and they're doing yeah. great they're doing great work. What connection do you have with all those many 
you know, institutions that are, that are spreading up all over Boston. So all we do them. grant making at a pretty small amount to all of those organizations. Um, and we also know them very well. I mean, we meet with them. We know their facilities. Usually we talk to them. I think I've talked to all of them about space. Every small nonprofit is kind of, it's kind of like a small business and the space issues are the same. It all has to be subsidized. It's all raising money and trying to secure something long term. I think the question is with the amount of money that our office has, if we can't really significantly fund a lot of these organizations, what else can we do for them? And I think it would be interesting to think about what it means to significantly, what it would mean like for our budget to significantly fund the kind of small to mid-sized organization that's trying to really make it and is still kind of scraping by year to year. In terms of space and other kinds of resources, I think that there's a lot that we do for them. What did you find when you took this over fully that was the biggest challenge for you? That's a good question. I think one of the biggest challenges is operationalizing what we want to accomplish. So we've done some work on things from the plan. I think we have ideas about how to keep that work going and start some new programs or initiatives. But what does it mean to actually translate that into how the office works right. and how we're funded? I think that's the biggest challenge. The state arts office, basically, the MCC, gives us some funding every year to re-grant through the Boston Cultural Council, which is uh -huh. a commission that we staff out of the office. And that's the only money that we get from the state. But so that's pretty static every year? They don't touch it if there's like some big change. They have it. to argue for their budget at the state every single year. And they went up a little bit this year, so we got a oh. little bit more money this year. So every city or town that has a local cultural council gets this allocation. The city, from the city budget, that's matched more than three times over. And mm. then that becomes kind of our pool of grant making funding. So we're still kind of a startup. Like we're still a new office in a lot of ways. It's oh, only yeah. been five years that it's existed in this form with the chief of arts and culture. And it's only... Some of our programs are only two or three years old. Given that, it's a really amazing increase, and yeah. the mayor's been great about it and has been super supportive. I think when we look at, like, what should it be at in 10 years, that's really the question that we need to look at now. Yeah. You know, there's a lot in the plan about arts education. I think in order to really fulfill that, we would have to think about what does it mean to have someone on staff who just works on arts education? What does that look like? What's our role in that ecosystem, given who's already there? Is it our role? Where does our role end? And maybe, like, a philanthropist or another nonprofit or, some, or a private sector company begin and we expect them to do something and then how does that translate into dollars speaking of dollars what is your outreach to just the companies in the industries in boston whether it be google or hopefully amazon eventually is there a, an outreach from you guys to get these huge monsters to come and fund some of the arts that are going on in boston it's something that I would love to start doing. Yeah. I think we have some existing relationships. I've been learning a lot from talking to um, the social impact folks at some of those companies, like what they're interested in right now, because it's a really different model of corporate giving from like, oh, your headquarters is here, so you fund things in Boston. That's not really how a lot of these companies are going. They're looking at you know, what is the giving that can align with that company's brand? Right. And they're looking globally at that. But we are working on a study with the Office of Workforce Development on pathways in creative industries. So how do, how can we get local Bostonians, you know, who might have an aptitude for something creative or for design or for music or whatever it is at an early age and make sure that there's a clear pathway for them through the public school system into a job at one of these creative economy companies. And that could be anything from like, you know, a music tech company to a shoe company to a design firm, you know, there's a whole range of things. And I think we're trying to figure out like, how can we make that connection and really think about a job pipeline for people? And the end game of that is definitely talking to employers and saying, what would it mean to have a local internship program or have like an arts collaborative in residence in your space? Like, how do we get that relationship going? Okay, so we were talking about cultural equity and equity issues in Boston and how that came up through Boston Creates. So what does it mean to actually do that work? Um, and we're trying to figure that out. And we're gonna be going into 2019 into a, an equity process where we bring on some consultants to do training with us as a staff, just as people who you know need to understand what racial equity is and be able to talk about it and understand our own position in it, but also understand our position in City Hall as people who are trying to advocate for the arts and City Hall can be kind of a tough place also. We're gonna do a process that's that kind of training piece and then we're going to go into more of a visioning process and think about what does it really mean to relaunch the mission of this office, thinking about equity. I think this will be very refreshing for a lot of people who don't think that in this concrete building that there's 
conversations about equity and making sure everyone's included and all that. I think that's great. A couple of years ago, I went to, it was kind of like a town hall. We actually had it at Isotope. Oh, Isotope. yeah. I think I might have been at that. Oh, okay. Maybe you were the one who spoke. I'm not sure. But what? someone someone went up and spoke from the city. I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was your predecessor. Hmm. And said, we have grants. We have. Oh, m- I think Edry said that because Edry was on the Boston Cultural Council. You mean Edry, Edry from Walter Sicker? Yep. Oh. So I think on behalf of the Boston Cultural Council, she went up and she was like, apply for our grants. We have grants. Oh, okay. So that that's her, so yeah. that's the, I remember because oh. I was like, you get him, Edry. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I was there when she said that and I didn't I didn't put the two and two together that she was the same person. It was like ATV retrospective. Yeah. So, <laughs> wow, that's great because we talked to Walter Sicker and all those folks and they're great. But anyways, that can be a problem that people don't yeah. know that these opportunities exist. So other than your Instagram account, what do we do? Yeah, so um, this past round of BCC grants has been exciting because this was the first time that we did like a big marketing and advertising push. Part of that, going off of the whole equity thing and thinking about how we can make these grants easier for people to access and just get the word out to people who might not have any idea that they even exist. We translated the application this year into five languages and we did flyers on the MBTA, like MBTA station posters that had the advertisement listed in Cape Verdean Creole, Chinese, Vietnamese, Spanish, and Haitian Creole, doing a way bigger push of getting people to hear about it. So we also did advertising on BUR on the radio. We did social media ads for the first time. So it was really exciting. It was a lot of just exploration. So now I think we kind of have the footwork laid out where we can think about what worked and what didn't work and then hopefully build off of that in the future. I'm glad you mentioned languages. You know, we take that for granted. We, we talk a lot about color, which is extremely important, obviously, in background. But languages are, they're, they're barriers. Mm-hmm. Not only will they not get the information, but they'll be, a lot of people will be shy. They won't mm-hmm. want to connect with these institutions. And um, so that's interesting. Why? I got one question about Marty or uh, Mar- uh, Mayor Walsh. <laughs> I don't know what the question is, but I just wanted to bring him up. <laughs> um, does he have, I mean, is there a music interest that you guys have talked about or you share? We haven't gone into a, um, like a sharing of, of music <laughs> preferences. I think that would be really fun to do. So, so if you guys he's are listening not to this, I'm open to doing that. I will say what I've enjoyed so much about the mayor, just as like a boss, he really actually cares about management. He's not just like, he cares about like how people treat their teams. He really genuinely cares about diversity in City Hall. Yeah. And he also trusts you. He trusts you as the subject matter expert. You know, we did this whole planning process. We did that work. And he's not going to be a micromanager. You know, he said, go forth, do the work. And that's been kind of amazing, actually. It's super supportive. And I think trusting of the process, which I think is kind of amazing. Which is great. Not very surprising knowing what I've seen about him and read. And that's awesome. Um, but I guess I'm also, I'm just wondering, like, you want to know his personal you guys taste. talk? I think I heard he just likes thrash metal. Is that right? <laughs> was it was it him or was it a governor that Joyce said, wrote her a letter? Charlie. Oh, it was Charlie. I think as long as Joyce is picking the music, we're probably all fine. Joyce's choices. So our governor wrote Joyce about, was it a review she did about the Clash or, oh, the, or Clash. the Sex Pistols? It was like in 19, like, Whoa, he, was really? a, he, was a, he was a kid. And complained so about funny. and complained about her bashing the concert or something. I can't remember exactly what it was. I'll have to yeah. go back and listen wow. to it. Yeah. But yeah, he was he he wrote to her I would complaining not have about that. that. Yeah, I think as it, it put him in a whole new light for me. That's interesting. But I thought that was cool. Yeah. But yeah, it wasn't our, it wasn't our mayor, it was our governor. <laughs> so we yeah, we have a very hip governing body here in Boston. Yeah, I don't know what that means, but yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it means either. We were actually looking outside. The, one of the, it's my, one of my favorite, um, speaking of art, it was one of my favorite statues in Boston is the one of Mayor White. Oh, yeah. I love that one with him walking and it's all windy and stuff like that. It's very old school Boston down there. Yeah, it's fun to see people interact with that one. Cause you can watch this is an awesome of, view, too, yeah. by the way. If you could have one goal for 2019, what would that be? I think it would be the equity work. Yeah. I think if we can do that, and do it well and take it really seriously. I think it's it's kind of a game changer for our work. It relates to efforts that are going on inside City Hall around diversity and equity. And I think we can be kind of a model for how to apply that to a department that otherwise isn't, it's not like the diversity office, right? It's a different kind of department. Right. But I think also we can reflect that back out into the sector because 
There are so many institutions and people for whom this is a daily topic of conversation, whether it's diversifying audiences or issues of ownership over venues. It's just like so present right now. If we can be leaders in that space, that's that's kind of everything. To that point, how do people, I don't want to give them your cell number, is there a website other than your Instagram account, how do people find out what's going on? How do they pe- people tell you information that you may need to know about their communities, whether it be about art, whether it be about their schools and music about their kid who's an 18 year old and wants to go see music and can't is how how do people bitch and moan to you so our website is boston.gov slash arts if people go there they can find all of our programs listed out and all of the grant opportunities and different things that people can apply for and then we also have like i said earlier artist resource manager she's a really good resource and she does office hours weekly with artists and people can either come in or just talk to her on the phone and sign up for a meeting with her so they can ask her any questions or get her advice on like permitting and things like that human interaction yeah <laughs> she's amazing Sorry, go ahead. yeah and i was just gonna say everyone should sign up for office hours with her and just like talk about their work and what they're doing because she's also been amazing at connecting people who might not have any reason to run into each other but she's been talking to so many people over the course of the last year and so she's been starting to really be that connector oh she also has her own newsletter yes which we have two i newsletters. think we have two newsletters one general arts office newsletter and then one from the artist resource manager which has i think kind of the best collection of resources for individual artists in the city of Boston that you can get by email. And it's like opportunities, jobs, grants, residencies, just all sorts of stuff. So you just go yeah, to boston.gov slash arts. So you can sign up for both of them. Okay. I like what you said that makes a lot of sense is that this is not a diversity branch of City Hall. This is an arts This is a cultural branch. That says it all, I think. Well, I think the thing that we bring to the table in that whole conversation is different narratives. Individual artists, whether they're like actually writing or they're musicians or they're visual artists, they're all producing different ideas of what should be and what the narrative of Boston should be. So I think even just by lifting those voices up and letting them speak for themselves, we'd be going a long way. This has been great. I think people are going to really appreciate all the thought and and work that goes into what you're doing and it puts a nice face on that government concrete face that people think it is and if anything this i hope this will encourage people to go out and vote in a couple weeks and to support people like you doing a great job so uh congratulations on the on becoming chief we were talking about how awesome the title that is being (laughs) chief ron wants to be chief he's not um but thank you both for for your time we really appreciate it Thanks. thanks We are really excited about how Kara is leading the way for Boston to become a city where the arts and artists can flourish. Learn more about their mission at boston.gov forward slash arts. We would like to thank both Kara and Christina for their hard work and conversation. Go to AboveTheBasement.com where you can join us on Patreon, sign up for our newsletter, listen and subscribe to our podcast, like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, and look at all the nice pictures we post on Instagram. We are everywhere. On behalf of Ronnie and myself, thanks for listening. Tell your friends and remember, Boston music, like its history, is unique. How would you like to join us in creating great conversations that inspire and connect? Patreon is a membership platform that provides a way for creators like us to build relationships and provide exclusive experiences to subscribers or patrons. We have been self-financed since we got off the ground in June of 2016, but in order to continue to fully invest all we can in each episode, we need your patronage. For more information, please go to patreon.com forward slash above the basement.